Hi, I'm Dave Fornell, the editor of Diagnostic and Interventional Cardiology magazine, and I'm here at the University of Colorado, and I'm here to talk about an overview of PFO closure and the treatment of cryptogenic shock. And I'm here with Karen Orhula. She is an assistant professor of neurology at the University of Colorado Stroke and Brain Aneurysm Center. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So you, you work in unison with the cardiology department as yes. a, a heart-brain team mm -hmm. uh, to identify patients uh, for intervention. And then there's a transcatheter intervention that takes place with either an amplifier or a gore device uh, to seal mm -hmm. any of the holes in the heart to prevent uh, emboli. Correct. So uh, tell me about the process. So basically this is fascinating because we have a multidisciplinary clinic. So uh, we have Dr. Carol and his team expertise in the, in the topic. And we also have our vascular neurologist who pretty much I'm, I'm leading also kind of like this clinic, but also have, we have uh, um, different neurologists that come and uh, assess the patient. We get the patients refer uh, from the community, from cardiology, neurology. We assess if the patient, um, from the neurology standpoint, if the patient actually has a stroke first, mm -hmm. or if the patient has a cryptogenic stroke. So depending on that, we um, try to adjust kind of like what we think. And uh, if we recommend um, PFO closure is because we are definitely certain that the patient needs that and the patient meet all the criteria that was um, pretty much established within the trials too. Sometimes we have different cases that we need a little bit more of like, um, I mean, teamwork and specifically trying to determine if the patient will qualify mm -hmm. uh, for PFO closure. And what sort of imaging workup do you do? So um, we try definitely to try to kind of like answer where, what's the etiology of the stroke. So mm -hmm. definitely one of our best tests is MRI of the brain. We look at the vessel, um, uh, extracranial, intracranial with MRAs or CTAs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we use other modalities like uh, carotid ultrasounds uh, to assess different things if we have some questions. Mm -hmm. It is very important to also know that if the patient um, had a completed already a cardiac monitor prior to this, especially in kind of like the patients that are a little bit older. Make sure it's so, not an arrhythmia. Correct, make sure there is, um, there is no paroxysmal AFib that could cause that. And especially kind of like, um, we also uh, try to identify other kind of like no um, typical causes of stroke, um, like infection, um, um, hormones, or um, hypercoagulable states as well. So we work with um, our um, hematologists also uh, try to determine if the patient will need sort of type of a different anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy or other, I mean, further testing. With the echocardiograms, is it which you generally use to actually identify the holes and, and look for the jets? Correct. So um, usually kind of like the first step that um, I think in overall uh, people use initially is a transthoracic echo. Uh, mm -hmm. What we do in stroke is definitely we, unless the patient has already a known a fib, but we try to with bubble with bubble study. Um, so that depending on that result in the right context of the patient. So you can see the bubble contrast passing correct, through the holes. Correct, correct. We, we try to look for that and we try to determine um, what is kind of like high risk PFO2 that mm -hmm. will also imply higher risk of, so, of kind of like being required PFO closure. So with that, um, we try to have a better view with a TEE um, and Dr. Carl will explain that, but it'll be better. But he uh, look at the echoes and, and determine also um, with his team if the patient, in fact, sometimes we have referrals of patients that they were told that they have a PFO mm -hmm. and they didn't. And uh, when we look at the images, actually, we kind of like rephrase everything and um, can like direct the patient to the right. Um, to the right kind of tract. After post device, mm -hmm. um, there is a dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for a certain amount of time, depending mm -hmm. on the device and depending on like, the indication. And we continue with monotherapy for, with antiplatelet therapy. Um, some specific cases, very rarely we use anticoagulation in cases, for example, of um, confirmed um, DVTs mm -hmm. um, or some underlying hypercoagulable disorder. So those patients probably have definitely a high risk of having a paradoxical embolism but also the PFO closure won't prevent to have further thrombotic events. So those specific cases, we, we have to uh, continue with antithrombotic and anticoagulation therapy in those, in those scenarios, yeah. Is there any crossover where you have, uh, you might evaluate a patient and say, well, the, yeah, they have some holes in the heart, but 
we can probably treat this uh, just with anticoagulation or just with antiplatelet therapy? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, and those cases are the cases most likely where the patient is not a cryptogenic stroke um, mm -hmm. case. So, uh, for example, I mean, one in four of uh, population have, 25% of the population has a PFO. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to close those 25% of the population. So uh, what we try to determine is, okay, you have a stroke, but is this a stroke a cryptogenic stroke, meaning that it's an embolic stroke that is cortical one that we have explored all our etiologies and we didn't find anything except that the P there is a PFO present. So in those patients that they're not qualifying for a cryptogenic stroke, definitely we combine or we do antithrombotic therapy or anticoagulation depending what's the underlying etiology, independent of they, if they have an incidental PFO. And, and you mentioned the use of MRI, and I'm assuming yes. that this is uh, MRAs for the brain. Correct. Uh, what exactly are you looking for? Because that's your department. Yeah, so in the MRI of the brain, what I try to determine is uh, location of the stroke. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a different variety of etiologies, and we have some um, classifications of stroke etiology as well. So we can have a lacunar stroke that usually is like the end circulation, very kind of like deep on the brain structures, like mm -hmm. brainstem and thalami. Um, so all of these small strokes are maybe due to hypertension that is different from having a clot that just travel downstream and occlude the vessel. So cortical stroke or embolic strokes of undetermined source is what I try to determine from the MRI and timing. And also um, in the MRI is very, is very important to see. Sometimes there is like monogenic um, stroke conditions that you can see also in MRI that will kind of like maybe could be um, not evident for the eye of like a, a general neurologist or a general practitioner. So a vascular neurologist's um, opinion on those cases are, are very important. And often the patients with cryptogenic stroke, this is uh, the most recent presentation is just in a long series of these types of strokes. Yes. You're able to see evidence of prior strokes uh, on the MRIs? Yes, yes. We, um, it depends on what was the cause, but definitely we see um, some kind of like timing or even um, old bleeds too, mm -hmm. that's important so we can see those in the MRI so we can determine better if that actually has to do with the current presentation mm -hmm. or also give us a clue some about the general etiology of the, of the overall etiology. And how many patients uh, are you treating currently with uh, some sort of PFO closure right now? So, so far our clinic just opened, um, I mean in 2011. Since 2011 mm -hmm. up to now, um, we have seen um, maybe 200 patients kind of combine. Mm -hmm. um, we um, determined that some of them don't, didn't have a stroke in fact, so mm -hmm. we didn't offer any treatment. Um, and the patients that we, that referral that in fact we confirmed that they had a stroke and it's a cryptogenic stroke, um, pretty much we close um, pretty much a big amount of the population that we see uh, with cryptogenic stroke that met all requirements. Yeah, like um, for example, today in clinic, we're gonna see four patients and we're gonna try to see if the, each patient has the requirements to, to be closed. So probably I will say like maybe 60, 70%, maybe Dr. Carl has better numbers for that, but mm -hmm. uh, the patients that we confirm that uh, cryptogenic stroke is, yeah, in fact, what is happening and the PFO uh, closure is indicated. Mm -hmm. So do you see uh, an increasing role with uh, neurology and cardiology or even vascular surgeons uh, moving forward with devices like this and other indications? Absolutely. I think that um, having the expertise of the cardiology or the vascular uh, surgeon uh, or the cardiac surgeon definitely uh, and acting as a team, as multidisciplinary approach is definitely best uh, in these complex cases. Mm -hmm. um, what I do think that I want to just point out is that FDA, um, with the approved devices that we have for PFO closure, the recommendation is that we have a shared decision-making process and a multidisciplinary evaluation for those patients. So shared decision-making process definitely is what is the best thing in patient-centered medicine um, in LA. So um, exposing the patient to a very rigorous evaluation from neurology, cardiology, um, talk about the risks and benefits. Uh, we lead the patient to understand a little bit better what's the patient risk and benefit, um, even um, health outcomes uh, with this procedure. So I think that definitely moving forward, I see this collaboration um, becoming a stronger. Um, I hope that more centers of excellence are um, um, arising throughout the country and around the world mm -hmm. um, to continue to tackle this, um, this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dave.